Legendary Passages, Episode 43, The Daughters of Ares, Amazons in the Island of Ares, from Apollonius Rhodius Argonautica. The next six episodes are the culmination of all the previous ones, including Heracles, Theseus, and the Argonauts, but focusing mainly on the Amazons, the fearsome Daughters of Ares. This passage recounts several adventures of the Argonauts, not long after they had abandoned Heracles, but before they had arrived at Colchis. After they sailed past the Calichorus River and the Aulian Cave, sacred to Dionysus, they came upon the grave of Sthenelus, son of Actor. He died helping Heracles fight the Amazons, and his spirit appeared to the Argonauts, who honored the fallen hero. Soon they picked up the three sons of Diamachus, and sailed near the land of the Amazons. The passage describes the river Thermodon, the Doeantian Plain, and the three tribes of the Amazons. Next, they passed the iron mines of Calabes, and then the Tiberini, where husbands shared the labor pangs of their wives. After that, they passed by the shameless land of Masanosi. Then, they come to the island of Ares, where the Stymphalian birds had migrated after being driven off by Heracles. One of the birds fired arrow-like feathers, wounding an Argonaut before another shot it down. They all put on their helmets and shields, and made loud noises as they sailed past. Next time we return to Heracles, and focus on his ninth and tenth labors, the Amazons and Geryon. The Daughters of Ares, a legendary passage from Apollonius Rhodius Argonautica, translated by R. C. Seaton. So on the twelfth day they went aboard at dawn, for a strong breeze of westerly wind was blowing. And with the oars they passed out through the river Acheron, and trusting to the wind, shook out their sails, and with canvas spread far and wide, they were cleaving their passage through the waves in fair weather. And soon they passed the outfall of the river Calichorus, where, as the tale goes, the Nicaean son of Zeus, when he had left the tribes of the Indians and come to dwell at Thebes, held revels and arrayed dances in front of a cave, wherein he passed unsmiling sacred nights, from which time the neighbors called the river by the name of Calichorus, and the cave Aulian. Next they beheld the barrow of Sthenelus, Actor's son, who on his way back from the Valerius War against the Amazons, for he had been the comrade of Heracles, was struck by an arrow, and died there upon the sea beach. And for a time they went no further, for Persephone herself sent forth the spirit of Actor's son, which craved with many tears to behold men like himself even for a moment. And mounting on the edge of the barrow, he gazed upon the ship, such as he was when he went to war, and round his head a fair helm with four peaks gleamed with its blood-red crust. And again he entered the vast gloom, and they looked and marveled. And Mopsus, son of Epicus, with word of prophecy, urged them to land and appropriate him with libations. Quickly they drew in sail and threw out hawsers, and on the strand paid honor to the tomb of Stenelus, and poured out drink offerings to him, and sacrificed sheep as victims. And beside the drink offerings they built an altar to Apollo, savior of ships, and burned thigh bones. And Orpheus dedicated his lyre, whence the place has the name of Lyra. And straightway they went aboard, as the wind blew strong, and they drew the sail down, and made it taut to both sheets. Then Argo was borne over the sea swiftly, even as a hawk soaring high through the air commits to the breeze its outspread wings, and is borne on swiftly, nor swerves in its flight, poising in the clear sky with quiet pinions. And lo, they passed by the stream of Parthenius as it flowed into the sea, a most gentle river, with a maid, daughter of Leo, when she mounts to heaven after the chase, cools her limbs in its much-desired waters. Then they spread onward in the night, without ceasing, and passed Sesimus and lofty Erethene, Corbialis, Cromna, and woody Cytorus. Next they swept round Corambus at the rising of the sun, and plied the oars past long Aegialius, all day and on through the night. 
and straightway they landed on the Assyrian shore, where Zeus himself gave a home to Sinope, daughter of Esopus, and granted her virginity, beguiled by his own promises. For he longed for her love, and he promised to grant her whatever her heart's desire might be. And she, in her craftiness, asked of him virginity. And in the like manner she deceived Apollo too, who longed to wed her, and beside them the river Hellas, and no man ever subdued her in love's embrace. And there the sons of noble Dimachus of Tricca were still dwelling, Dileon, Autolycus, and Phlogius, since the day when they wandered far away from Heracles, and they, when they marked the array of chieftains, wished to meet them and declared in truth who they were, and they wished to remain there no longer, but as soon as Argestes Blue went on shipboard. And so with them, borne along by the swift breeze, the heroes left behind the river Halys, and left behind his that flows hard by, and the delta land of Assyria. And on the same day they rounded the distant headland of the Amazons, that guard their harbor. Here, once when Melanope, daughter of Ares, had gone forth, the hero Heracles caught her by ambush, and Apolita gave him her glistening girdle as her sister's ransom, and he sent away his captive unharmed. In the bay of this headland, at the outfall of Thermidon, they ran ashore, for the sea was rough for their voyage. No river is like this, and none sends forth from itself such mighty streams over the land. If a man should count every one, he would lack but four of a hundred, but the real spring is only one. This flows down to the plain from the lofty mountains, which, men say, are called the Amazonian mountains. Thence it spreads inland over a hilly country straight forward, wherefore its streams go winding on, and they roll on, this way and that evermore wherever best they can reach the lower ground, one at a distance and another near at hand, and many streams are swallowed up in the sand and are without a name. But, mingled with a few, the main stream openly bursts with its arching crest of foam into the inhospitable Pontus. And they would have tarried there and have closed in battle with the Amazons, and would not have fought without bloodshed, for the Amazons were not gentle foes, and regarded not justice those dwellers on the Doanotian plain. But grievous insolence and the works of Ares were all their care. For by race they were the daughters of Ares and the nymph Harmonia, who bare to Ares war-loving maids, wedded to him in the glens of the Aconian wood, had not the breezes of Argestes come back again from Zeus. And with the wind they left the rounded beach, where the Themyscirian Amazons were arming for war. For they dwelt not gathered together in one city, scattered over the land, parted into three tribes. In one part dealt the Themyscirians, over whom at that time Apolita reigned, another the Lycastians, and in another the dart-throwing Chadesians. And the next day they sped on, and at nightfall they reached the land of the Calabedes. That folk have no care for plowing with oxen, or for any planting of honey-sweet fruit, nor yet do they pasture flocks in the dewy meadow. They cleave the hard iron-bearing land, and exchange their wares for daily sustenance. Never does the morn rise for them without toil, but amid bleak sooty flames and smoke they endure heavy labor. And straightway thereafter they rounded the headland of Ganesian Zeus, and sped safely past the land of the Tiberini. Here, when wives bring forth children to their husbands, the men lie in bed and groan with their heads close bound. But the women tend them with food and prepare childbirth baths for them. Next, they reach the sacred mount and the land where the Masanosi dwell amid the high mountains in wooden huts, from which that people take their name. And strange are their customs and laws. Whatever it is right to do openly before the people or in the marketplace, all this they do in their homes, but whatever acts we perform at home, these they perform out of doors in the midst of the streets, without blame. Among them is no reverence for the marriage bed, but, like swine that feed in herds, no wit abashed in others' presence, on the earth they lie with the women. Their king sits at the loftiest hut, and dispatches upright judgments to the multitude, poor wretch. 
For if haply he err at all in his decrees, for that day they keep him shut up in starvation. They pass them by, and cleft their way with oars over against the island of Ares all day long, for at dusk the light breeze left them. At last they spied above them, hurtling through the air, one of the birds of Ares which haunt that isle. It shook its wings down over the ship as she sped on and sent against her a keen feather, and it fell on the left shoulder of goodly Oileus, and he dropped his oar from his hands at the sudden blow, and his comrades marveled at the sight of the winged bolt. And Erebutes from his seat hard by drew out the feather and bound up the wound, when he had loosed the strap hanging from his own sword sheath, and besides the first, another bird appeared, swooping down. The hero Clytius, son of Eurytus, for he bent his curved bow, and sped a swift arrow against the bird, struck it, and it whirled round, and fell close to the ship. And to them spake Amphidemus, son of Aeleus. The island of Ares is near us. You know it yourselves, now that ye have seen these birds. But little will arrows avail us, I trow, for landing. Let us contrive some other device to help us, if ye intend to land, bearing in mind the injunction of Phineas. For not even could Heracles, when he came back to Arcadia, drive away with bow and arrow the birds that swam on the Stymphalian lake. I saw it myself, but he shook in his hand a rattle of bronze, and made a loud clatter as he stood upon a lofty peak, and the birds fled far off, screeching in bewildered fear. Wherefore now too let us contrive some such device, and I myself will speak, having pondered the matter beforehand. Set on your heads your helmets of lofty crest, then half row by turns, and half fence the ship about with polished spears and shields. Then altogether raise a mighty shout, so that the birds may be scared by the unwanted din, the nodding crests, and the uplifted spears on high. And if we reach the island itself, then make a mighty noise with the clashing of shields. Thus he spake, and the helpful device pleased all. And on their heads they placed helmets of bronze, gleaming terribly, and the blood-red crests were tossing. And half of them rode in turn, and the rest covered the ship with spears and shields. And, as when a man roofs over a house with tiles, to be an ornament of his home and a defense against rain, and one the fits firmly into another, each after each. So they roofed over the ship with their shields, locking them together. And as a din arises from the warrior host of men sweeping on, when the lines of battle meet, such a shout rose upward from the ship into the air. Now they saw none of the birds yet, but when they touched the island and clashed upon their shields, then the birds in countless numbers rose in flight hither and thither, and as when the sons of Cronus sends from the clouds a dense hailstorm on city and houses, and the people who dwell beneath hear the din above the roof and sit quietly, since the stormy season has not come upon them unawares, but they have first made strong their roofs, so the birds sent against the heroes a thick shower of feather shafts as they darted over the sea to the mountains of the land opposite.